In elementary school, teachers drive home the concepts of the ABCs, numbers, and how to read and write. Teachers play a crucial role in the formation of our youth. In the same way, Bible teachers have enormous influence on members of a church. False doctrines can be easily spread. Today, listen as Jesus tells an ancient church to reject the teachings he hates. From the Moody Church in Chicago, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. Today, Erwin Lutzer continues his eight-part series on what Jesus thinks of his church. We're in Revelation chapter 2, learning about the church at Pergamum and the false teachers known as the Nicolaitans. In the church at Ephesus, it's very interesting. Jesus said, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Here in the church in Pergamum, the Nicolaitans are accepted. They are woven into the congregation, and they are a part of the teaching of Balaam. It may well be that the teaching is that of Balaam, but the teachers who taught it were known as the Nicolaitans. Very clearly, the Nicolaitans were immoral. We know that much. So Jesus says, uh, you know, on the one hand, I commend your accuracy and your willingness to actually suffer for my name, but you are tolerating within the congregation the idea that you can commit immorality and still walk with God, and there are many different ways that people justify that, and the fact that because you're under the covenant of God, that sin isn't as bad as it would be otherwise. There was a woman who came to her pastor who said, you know, I, I'm living in sin, but, but uh, it's not that bad. Uh, I'm a Christian. And he said very wisely, it is worse because you are a Christian. It is worse. It's not better. It's worse. So we see here the weakness of the church. Let's hurry on and look at the warning to the church. Now I'm in verse 16, where Jesus says, Therefore repent, if not, I will come to you soon and will war against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus is saying you have to repent. To repent means a change of mind. It means a change of direction. It means that we now go in the opposite way. That's what repentance is. It's an humble acknowledgement of sin. It is when God makes us so miserable in our sin that we are willing to put up with anything to get fully right with him. That's what really leads to repentance. Sometimes it is said, well, you know, I've had people say to me regarding a certain situation, do you think that this person has seen the light? Well, my experience has been that people do not change when they have seen the light. We as human beings only change when we feel the heat. Then we change. It takes more than light. There are people with tons of light walking in grave darkness. And so what God does is, he says, you know, you have to repent. You have to lay your sins down. You have to come to me. In repentance, And then he says these words, and isn't it startling to see that the image of Jesus in the seven churches is so radically different, and actually throughout the whole book of Revelation, is so radically different than the image of Jesus that the world today has. The world today thinks, well, you know, wasn't Jesus just saying we should love everybody, and, and that's kind of the end of it, and... Didn't he love everybody? Yeah, he loved everybody. But this is the same Jesus. And he says, if not, I will come to you. And what did he say? And war against you. I personally don't want to be at war with Jesus. But he says, I will come and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, now is the time for us to comment on verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. What is the two-edged sword? If you were to ask Augustine, the great philosopher and theologian of the uh, third and fourth centuries, really I guess he lived in the fifth, 
He would say that it was the Old Testament and the New Testament because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of the sunder of the soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Well, the sword is the word of God. It says in the 19th chapter of Revelation that Jesus is coming and the sword of his word is coming out of his mouth. And later on, you have the great battle and the great victory that Jesus won. Now, it's interesting that the Word of God does many things to us. The Word of God cleanses us. Now you're clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. The Word of God saves us, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the living Word of God which lives and abides forever. It has an effect upon us. It encourages us. It blesses us. But the same word that does all that also judges us. And the same gospel that has transformed us is the same gospel that is going to judge us. I was rereading this this morning, as I always do before I am preaching here. I get here early to the church and... Uh, think through my message and read the text many times. And I, I was astounded by the fact that the same Bible that talks so much about grace is so incredibly intolerant when it comes to sin. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, all this grace out there, yeah, that's wonderful. And then, so intolerant about sin. But thankfully, it isn't just intolerant about sin. It shows us the way, doesn't it? So then you have the warning, repent or else, or I will judge you with the sword of my mouth. This is the meek and mild Jesus. Finally, what is the reward to the overcomers? Verse 17, he says now, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I've commented on this before and reminded you that there are many people who hear the words, but they don't have an ear to hear. The words are there, but the heart is somewhere else. Hmm. Whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the